to First Baptist Church. Welcome to our morning service and Facebook friend. We're honored to have you also. Uh, let's stand on our feet and turn to your hymn book to page 146. Page 146, a shelter in the time of storm. Think about that. A shelter in the time of storm, page 146. I know we all could relate. Sometimes when you experience a, a, a storm, a heavy rain, it's upon you, and you're looking for shelter. Have you ever been there? You're looking for shelter, maybe a roof. You, you, want, you want a roof over your head. Well, guess what? In, 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 the, in the Christian life, you're going to experience a lot of storms, a lot of trials. A lot of testings, a lot of pressure, and you know, Jesus is a shelter in the time of storm. He is, amen? I could relate. He's been there for me. He's been my shelter. We all face storms, and he's the one to hide to. He is the shelter in the time of storm. And I, I was thinking of that song, and I thought of Philippians chapter 4, where in, in verse 4 and 5 and 6, where it says, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, the Lord is at hand. That's the last statement of verse uh, 5. That means the Lord is near. The Lord, and then it says, be anxious for nothing. That word anxious, be careful for nothing. It says, don't worry about anything. Don't stress about anything because the Lord is near. Put those two together. He's near. He is the shelter in the time of storm. So think about the words. And uh, it's not just word, but it's, uh, it's, it's truth that could be applied to our life. We just got to learn to go to him and trust him during storms of life. Amen. So let's sing this together. Uh, page 146, a shelter in the time of storms. for our second hymn this morning, which is hymn number 312, 
Open my eyes that I may see. Hymn number 312, Open my eyes that I may see. Shelter in the time of storm, open my eyes, Lord, that I may see. Jesus could do that. He could do that. I want, that's what we want, the Lord to open our spiritual eyes more. Don't you want spiritual 2020 vision? Amen? I want spiritual discernment so I can make right decision, and the Lord could do that. So when you hear this song, think about the words. They're very powerful. There's a message right there when you think about the words. But it's good to see you this morning, and uh, uh, we have, uh, I know we have a, uh, here in, in, in First Baptist Church, uh, we got Toro, he's here, his family, he's the father of my two nieces, uh, so good to see you, Toro, all the way from Florida, Amen. he's here with us, Toro, Amen. God bless you, my friend, you look great, and he's always happy to see him here this morning. Then we have on my left side here for the very first time, we got Tim. Tim. Tim is here. Tim, God bless you. I met Tim. Make sure you shake Tim's hand, greet him. Thank you for coming. And I ask visitors when they come, how'd you hear about us? I'm just curious. Uh, he says, that guy over there. He pointed to Jerry. He said, that guy over there. I said, how'd you met him? He goes, I was uh, in the park. And then he showed up talking to me about Jesus, and look, that was about two or three weeks ago, and he's here. Amen. Praise the Lord, amen. amen? Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Praise the Lord. I told him, I said, uh, oh, so you were just minding your own business in the park, and this guy show up to disturb you, to disturb you, huh? I'm just kidding. But um, good to see Tim. We have a, a visitor's back for you, Tim. Uh, there's uh, uh, some gifts there for you so you can remember us. So uh, let's give uh, Toro and Tim a welcome from First Amen. Baptist Church. Amen. Welcome. Amen. Amen. Maybe Brother Jerry, maybe give uh, Toro a gift back too so he could remember us too. So uh, it's a nice good book in there on the promises of God that I'm sure it could encourage Toro to claim God's promises when he experienced trials in his life because we all experience trials in our life. 
Thank you all who are uh, our team players. And I was looking at that grass. Uh, Jared did an excellent job. That grass looks great. And thank you for keeping the church clean. And thank you for those who go out faithfully sowing the seed, uh, passing out gospel tracts and, and soul winning and knocking on doors and uh, uh, keep, keep the faithfulness, not in vain in the Lord. That's what it's all about. That's why Jesus came. And then keep grabbing some of those uh, gospel tracts that we have there in the hallway. That's what we got them there for. So you could grab them, put them in your purse, lady, guys, put them in your pocket, and just spread the word. Spread it everywhere, amen? So praise the Lord for that. The gospel is going on. So, man, will you come and let's uh, pray for the offering and ask the Lord to meet with us. Uh, look, if you're a visitor... We're not here to take your money. We're happy you're here. We just want to encourage you. We want to be a blessing to you. And uh, we want God to uh, minister to your heart. And we want, to, we want to be instruments of that. So we're not here to take you. Let the plate pass right by you. Uh, this is for God's people. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for uh, uh, the offering, Lord, the opportunity to be able to, Lord, pay the bills here so God's work could go on and uh, God's people are paying the bills and we thank you for them and the Bible said that God loved it, a cheerful giver it is more blessed to give than to receive Lord bless the giver bless the visitors bless everybody here Lord and I pray you bless even the message that's coming up soon Lord because that's the main that's the main thing of this service Lord we thank you for the songs thank you for the hymns Thank you for the special that is about to be sung. I pray you bless that special. But Lord, this is all preparation for the main event of the service, which is the preaching of your word. We ask that you bless it in a very special way. In Jesus' name, amen. stand if you're able now for our third hymn this morning and please turn in your songbook to number 119 which is till the storm passes by hymn number 119 till the storm passes by and I was just thinking about uh, even a sermon that uh, Pastor Santos preached where in the boat and Jesus calmed the waves he calmed the storm and they said what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him but the second time they said, truly this is the Son of God who did the same miracle.
Please remain standing for the reading of God's word, of course, which is in the book of James. So please turn to James chapter 5, and we'll be looking at verses 10 through 11. The book of James chapter 5, 10 and 11. Amen. Good seeing everybody here. James 5, 10 through 11. We'll read all together. Ready? Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Thank you. you may be seated. The title of my message this morning is Job, a man of patience. Job, a man of patience. I want you to notice there's a phrase there in James chapter 5 in verse 11 that describes Job's character. There's a phrase there that kind of jumped out on me when I was working in this message, uh, and it's on James chapter 5 in verse 11, this, uh, you ought to underline this phrase because it says we have heard, right in the middle of that verse, James chapter 5, verse 11, we have heard of the patience of Job. You should underline that in your Bible or highlight it or something. We have heard of the patience of Job. Let's pray, Father, bless this time, empower me. Lord, use me for your glory. Help me to bring the message across clearly. Pray nobody will miss it, remove distraction, because we know, we know the work of the devil. We know that the devil shows up on time when the word of God has been preached. He likes to throw a lot of distraction, a lot of hindrances, Lord, because he, he wants to take the word of God out of our hearts. Not only so we don't believe and be saved, but also... So we don't, our faith don't grow. So we don't get the message that God has for us. Because all of us here, we all need patience. All of us need a, a boost, an increase of patience as we face trials in our life. And Job is our example, Lord. Job, a man of patience. And we learn from the example of Job. Bless this message in Jesus' name, amen. So the New, the new Testament character trade that best describes Job is patient. And patient, I believe, is something that we all need. We all need it and we all want it. Anybody wants patient? Anybody needs patient this morning? I know I do need it. Patient is something that we all need. And we all want some need it more than others. Something that we need and we all want, <clears throat> but we seldom like to go through, uh, don't want to go through what it takes to obtain it. I mean, I see a lot of hands go up, but when you hear what we got to go through to obtain it, I think you will change your mind. You say, I think I'm okay where I am with my patience. Because what does it take to obtain patience? What does it take to obtain patience? What the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us, the writer of James tells us, James chapter 1, verse 3. James chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. There it is. That's how you obtain patience. That's how you increase and get a boost of your patience. That's how God will stress your patience. God, how's God going to allow it? He's going to allow testings in your life. He's going to allow suffering in your life. He's going to allow pressure in your life. He's going to allow obstacles in your life. He's going to allow challenges in your life. He's going to allow storms in your life. He's going to allow valleys in your life. He's going to allow tough times in your life. 
it says the shrine of your faith. As long as you live in this body and you are in this earth, your faith will always be tested by God. Because of faith that cannot be tested, cannot be trusted. God is looking for trusting faith. And how do you build trust in faith? You get tested. That's what the scripture tells us. That's what I read. Also in Romans chapter 5. Continues about how do we obtain this patience that we all need. And we all want. But we don't like what it takes to go through it. Romans chapter 5 verse 3 it says this. It says... And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Do you hear that? So we suppose we're the opposite. We don't. The Bible said we're supposed to glory and rejoice in tribulation, in trials. We we groan. We're the opposite, right? We complain. When we go through tribulations and testings and trials, you want God to remove it out of your life. Sometimes you ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? Everything's going wrong. More trials and more trials. No, maybe it's because you're doing right. Because as we're going to see that story in our text, Job was doing right. And he got tested. His faith got tested. So it says there, knowing Romans 5, 3, that tribulation, and that word tribulation, it means distress. It has to do with oppression. It has to do with trouble. It has to do with pressing together. It has to be with pressure. It has to be to be afflicted, to be burdened. So Christians, we have their faith tested. They will go through distress. They will go through oppression. They will go through trouble. They will go through pressure. They will go to affliction and they will feel burden at times. God will use all of these to accomplish and to work fully their patient. That's what the scripture says to glory in Romans chapter 5 verse 3 in tribulations. Not groan, not complain, glory because God has a purpose behind it. Amen? We got to have the right attitude when we respond, to, to respond properly to trials. And that's why I think it's James also uh, I don't know if it's verse 2 that says, uh, uh, my brethren, come little joy when you fall into diverse temptation. That word temptation means testing or trials. We respond with a joyful attitude. So the scripture says to glory and tribulation, to come little joy when you fall into diverse temptation. So no testing, no trials, no trouble, no pressure, no patience. That's what it takes to obtain patience. You still want patience? That's, that's God's formula. That's God's formula. The patience of Job refers to the endurance and the perseverance of Job in the face of adversity. That's what that word patience means. It means endurance. It is the perseverance, the endurance of Job in the face of adversity. And trust me, he faced tremendous adversity. When I look at the trouble that Job faced when he was tempted by the devil and the devil really shook his faith. When I see the trouble that he went through and I look at my troubles, they're Mickey Mouse compared to real severe suffering that Job went through. I mean, you think you got it bad, nothing compared to what Job went through. Nothing compared. When Job's face was being tried, he lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his wealth, his possession. He even lost, he, 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 he lost his health too. And he didn't even have nobody to tap him in the shoulder and to encourage him and to cheer him up when he was in the valley. When he was down in the valley, he had nobody to cheer him up because even his friends, the Bible said they were miserable comforters. They were miserable encouragers uh, uh, some of us, maybe we got friends, and when we go through hard times or whatever, you know, they, they try to encourage you. That's friends are for, right? But his friend, the so-called friend, they were miserable comforters. That's how the Bible describes them. They accuse him of sin. 
They say, you're going through this because of sin, Joe. So, I believe very few in the history of the world have ever suffered so much loss in such a short time as Job. And, and it happened all of a sudden. Everything was going, life was good for Job, but all of a sudden, it was like a tsunami of trials and afflictions and pressure and obstacles. He lost everything. And to make things worse, his wife told him in Job chapter 2, verse 9, to curse God and die. That's why his wife told him, why don't you just drop there, Job? Give up. Throw in the towel. God is not with you. That's why, uh, you know, his wife should be the cheerleader. But she didn't fulfill her purpose as a cheerleader to her husband as to help me. Instead, she threw more salt in the wound. Why don't you just curse God and die? Why don't you just drop that? Why don't you just give up? Quit on God. Just stop trusting God. Give up. And then his friends again, they were miserable comforter. They call him a hypocrite. They call him a liar and a wicked man. They say that he was going through what he was going through because of sin, because he was a hypocrite, a liar, and wicked. Yeah, through all of, the, all of this, Job was patient. He never cursed God or turned from him. He never charged God foolishly. That's what the Bible tells us in Job chapter 1, verse 22. Job was a sinner just like you and I. He has shortcomings just like you and I. He has flaws just like you and I. He was weak flesh just like you and I. And yet, after he went through all this, his wife encouraged him to quit, to just drop dead at the moment. His friends accused him of sin, of being a liar, wicked, a hypocrite. He lost everything, and in, in spite of all this, he did not. He never quit on God. He never lost faith in God. And he never charged God foolishly. Job chapter 1, verse 22 tells us that he never charged God foolishly. He didn't blame God like many Christians do. He didn't get bitter at God. He didn't even blame God. His wife did. He didn't. The testings and trials did not make Job bitter, but better and stronger. Amen? So, God's people get tested so they can become better, not bitter, not worse, but better and stronger. That's the whole purpose of testing. If you go into trials in your life and your attitude is getting worse, and your sadness is getting worse, and your discouragement is getting worse, then you don't understand the purpose God allowed trials in your life. You need to get back to the Bible and start going by feelings and emotion. You need to start, start being under the circumstances and be on top of the circumstances and realize that God is in control of everything that comes into your life and my life. Amen? Somebody said that storm make trees take deeper roots. It's true. The more storms... The tree encounters, the deeper the root gets, and the stronger the tree grows. So somebody said, storm make trees take deeper roots. Joseph, in Job chapter 23, listen to this in verse 10. Job said in Job chapter 23 in verse 10, look what he says. I mean, he's going through severe trials. No man ever in history went to the trial that Job went through. And while he's in the midst of this crisis and there's chaos in his life, he says in Job chapter 23, verse 10, but he knoweth the way that I take. And when he had tried me, I should come forth as gold. And by the way, he did come forth as gold. He did pass the testing. His wife did it, but he did pass the testing, and he did come out as pure gold. A furnace will test a precious metal. I'm sure that you have, I'm sure that many of you have seen a burning metal in a furnace. Have you ever seen a burning metal in a furnace? It looks red hot and glowing. It looks red hot and glowing. What's the purpose? 
Well, the he will separate the dross and the impurities. It will get the dross and impurities out. The metal is put in this heat process for what? To purify. To purify. And Job passed the heat test. He passed the heat test. He uh, endured the test. He came forth as precious gold. He was precious in God's eyes. Job was precious in God's eyes. You know, uh, uh, the Bible tells us a lot about Job's character. Right in Job chapter 1, God gives a, a great compliment about Job. He introduces Job when he, before the storm came into his life, before the devil shook him up. God gave the character of Job. He, he gave an introduction of Job, and it's an incredible compliment. You know how God described Job in, in the first few verses in Job, in Job chapter 1? God called him. He was perfect. I mean, he was sinless. That is not the, he was mature. Not only he was perfect, the Bible said that he was upright. That's how God described him, upright. That means he was honest. He was full of integrity. I mean, he was, uh, and then he uh, showed evil, the Bible describes him. That means he turned away from evil. He was a God-fearing man. Also, he, he feared God. He was a God-fearing man. He showed evil. He turned away from evil. He was a sin-hating man. Won't you want God to say that about you? You're mature, you're upright, you're reliable, you're honest, you got integrity. When, when, and then he, he, he fears me. He has shown evil. He departs from evil. He's a God-fearing, sin-hating man or a God-fearing, sin-hating woman. That would be a good compliment for God to say that about you or me. But guess what? He said that about Job right before he went to the trial and right after the trial, he was still retaining that character in God's eyes. He was pure gold in God's eyes. Pure gold. His friends saw, Job's friends saw the dross and the impurities in Job's life. They call him a hypocrite. They call him a liar, a wicked man. But God saw him precious and pure. God saw him perfect and upright and a, a man that feared God and it showed evil. Why? He was patient. He was patient. His patience paid off at the end. That's what he's known for. You have heard of the patience of Job. He was a man of patience. And it paid off. His patience paid off at the end. Look with me in James chapter 5, verse 10. James chapter 5, verse 10. It says, Take my brethren, the prophets who has spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Again, that word patience means endurance. That's what that word patience means in the Bible. It means endurance. In verse 11 it says, it goes on in verse 11, James chapter 5, verse 11, Behold, we count them, these prophets that he mentioned in the, in the previous verse, who has spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering. They really suffer affliction and patient endurance. Behold, we count them happy. See that word happy? That word happy means blessed. We count them blessed which endure. So look, God blesses patience. God blesses endurance. God blesses endurance. We look back upon the prophets in the Old Testament, such as Isaiah, and he did suffer, Jeremiah. He did suffer in Daniel, Joseph, Job. We, we, we look at them with great deal of respect. We honor them for their life of zeal, devotion, and dedication to God. And in this sense, we call them blessed. They're happy, they're blessed. James tells us to remember the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of, of, of patience. Many of them suffer affliction, yet they patiently persevere to the end. They did not waver. They kept trusting God no matter what. And they patiently persevered. They went through great trials and suffering and endured with patience. That's what the scripture tells us. And those who in the past endured great hardship yet patiently persevere, are counted blessed. 
Verse 11, it says, they're blessed, they're happy. Behold, we count them blessed, which endure. That word blessed means happy. Don't you want to be happy? Well, you got you to learn how to endure trials and, and, and test things in your life with a spiritual stamina, with the strength of the Lord. And you're going to be a happy person, and it's going to pay it off at the end. Like it paid off with Job. Because he was a man of patience. People to this day name their children after such great men of God that endured to the end faithfully. How many people call their, their, their kids Daniel? They call them, you know, uh, 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 Job. Uh, or, or call their kids uh, Paul or Joseph. I mean, we, we, uh, we call them by these great prophets who just were a great example to us of suffering and affliction and they yeah endure patiently and persevere with patience i think of janice she was a you that call your three kids bible names was a you that's a good idea she called all them start with the letter j james john right what's the other one joseph look at that all three of them James is telling you the story about you have heard of the patient of Job. What a great character to follow. Uh, and John and, and Joseph. Notice she didn't call him Judas. Notice she did not call him Cain. Cain. Not too many people call their children Cain. Right? Or Judas. Or Demas. Remember Demas in the New Testament? Demas who was a uh, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, the apostle Paul gave a sock commentary about demons. For demons have forsaken me for loving this present world. That's the last time you hear from demons. He started well. He was apostle Paul's uh, uh, praying and preaching partner. And for you to be with the apostle Paul as a partner, for him to recruit you, you got to be tough. You got to be tough to hang with that guy. My huh, brother Jerry, <laughs> real tough. A guy gets beat up, and he he's, he's, he could barely walk, wounded, and he goes back and preaches the gospel to the very spot where they where they stone him and they beat him up. He was unstoppable. Well, guess what? Demas was re, Paul recruited Demas, and he ran the race in the beginning, but he quit. He loved the world. Paul said, "For Demas have forsaken me for this for loving this present world." We see that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. By the way, that's a testimony of many people that started well in the Christian life. They're no longer here because they love the world more than commitment to Jesus Christ. Nobody calls their kids demons. If we want to be blessed, we must follow their example of suffering, affliction, and of patience of those great prophets of Job, who's a good example. In that example of suffering, James used Job as an example of a man who patiently endured suffering and was blessed by God for his patience, for his perseverance, for his endurance. Look at verse 11, James chapter 5, verse 11. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So in the end, his patience, his endurance was rewarded. God gave him double blessings at the end to Job's life. God, he lost everything, but God gave him double blessings at the end. He had more than what he had in the beginning. Why? Patience. Endurance. This tells us that in enduring troubles in the Christian life, God will certainly reward his people. God is reminding us of Job. We see the end of the Lord using the trial of Job. God had mercy upon him and blessed him after his trial. God gave him double blessing. Look at that. God gave him double blessing. James is reassuring his readers that God had a purpose for their suffering just as he did for Job and he did for Joseph and he did for Daniel. Guess what? He's the same God. He'll do it for you. He'll do it for you. He haven't changed. He's still a good God. His purpose haven't changed. His plan haven't changed. So God revealed himself as he always does. How? 
how does God reveal himself to us? To be very pitiful, to be very compassionate, and of tender mercy. That's what it says there. In verse uh, 11, you have heard of the patient of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. That's how God always reveals himself. That's one of God's attributes. He's tender, he's compassionate, he's pitiful. You better thank God for that. He's very patient with us, amen? You better thank God he doesn't have your patience or my patience. He's very pitiful. He's compassionate, he's full of mercy. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting your cares or your anxieties or your worries upon him, for he cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, tell us it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. You better thank God for that. We're not burning in hell because of the Lord's mercies. Because his compassion fell not, they're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Did you see that? That's the merciful God, the pitiful God. That's how he revealed himself to us. He haven't changed. Amen? Look, we're, 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 we're pretty good. We like to focus a lot on the negative. And God, look, all of us got problems. All of, all of us could, could talk about negative things that happen every day to us. But you know what? There's more good, there's more positive than negative. Come on now. And the little book of Jude, just one chapter, I think it's verse 21, it says to keep yourself in the love of God, always looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what that little book of Jude tells us in verse 21. Keep yourself in the love of God. He's very loving, he's very caring, he's pitiful, he's compassion, he's of tender mercy, he's forgiving, he cares. He does, amen? And keep yourself in the love of God, Jude says, Always looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus. Hey, have you seen the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, his compassion, his faithfulness in your life today? How about yesterday? How about the day before yesterday? Have you taken time to count your blessings and name them one by one? Or are you just going to wait until Thanksgiving when you gather with the family and thank them for blessings? He's not just good to you on Thanksgiving. Once a month, he's good to you every day because his mercy is on you every morning. Every morning it's a new supply of God's blessings and mercies. Anybody overwhelmed by the mercies of God, his compassion, his faithfulness? I know I'm overwhelmed. I know I don't deserve them. Somebody got to get excited. Somebody got to be overwhelmed by his mercy and his pitiful. He's of tender mercy. He's forgiven. That's the God he is. And the scripture repeatedly affirm his compassion and mercy. Just to give you some, um, some verses here. In, um, in Exodus, <clears throat> in Exodus chapter 34, let me just read it to you in Exodus chapter 34, in verse 6. In Exodus chapter 34, in verse 6, look what it says. I mean, there's a lot of verses. Exodus 34, in verse 6, it says this. It says, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That's our God. That's our God. I read to you from Numbers chapter, Numbers chapter 14. It says in Numbers chapter 14, in verse 18, in verse 18, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. And then in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, it says this. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, look what it says. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 13. 1 Chronicles Chapter 21, in verse 13, it goes like this. And David said unto God, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. For very great are his mercies, but let, but let me not fall into the hand of man. Don't you rather fall in the hand of God? He's merciful. 
than rather fall in the selfish hand of man who many times are harsh and cruel and unforgiving and bitter and angry and full of wrath. Amen? I'd rather fall in the hand of a merciful God because that's who God is. Second Chronicles chapter 30, verse 9. Second Chronicles chapter 30. Look what it says in verse 9. For, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 30. In verse 9, it says this. It says, For if you turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that led them captive, so that they should come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. I don't care the sins you have committed. If you repent and you come back to the Lord for forgiveness, he will never turn you away. I don't care how, how deep you are backsliding, how rebellious you are, what a prodigal wayward son or daughter you have, you better pray that they repent, they could be restored. Amen? Because God is merciful. God will never turn away a repentant sinner, never. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will make you new again. Because that's the God that we serve. Psalm 25. Psalm 25. It says in verse 6, Psalm 25, in verse 6, look what it says. Psalm 25, verse 6. It says, Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, and thy loving kindnesses, for they are being ever of old. It's just, it, that's, oh, it's nothing new of God. He's been the same God for thousands of years, and he, the same God. That's how he's known for. I mean, I could just go on. The scripture repeatedly affirmed his compassion and mercy. Psalm 78, verse 38. Psalm 86, verse 5, verse 15. Psalm 103, verse 8, verse 13. Psalm 116, verse 5. Psalm 136, verse 1. Psalm 145, verse 8. Joel chapter 2, verse 13. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. Micah 7, 18. Luke 6, 36. I'm only scratching the surface. All those verses are firm over and over repeatedly that God is, is a God of compassion and mercy. Why do I mention that? Because I think we are guilty of doing trials of losing sight of who God is. We are accusing of being unloving and uncaring. That's the devil speaking to your mind. That's the devil speaking to your mind. Because that's not the God in the Bible. That's not the God in the Bible. Remember the Lord's character. He's very pitiful and of tender mercy. I don't know about you, but that's a great comfort for me and strength when I'm experiencing trials and crisis in my life. That I know that God's not trying to hurt me. He has a purpose, and I got to trust his purpose, and I got to let God be God. Amen? That's what we need to do. The question is not why. That's not, the question is not asking God why, but who is in it, and God is using it for your own good and your own strength and not to make you worse, not to make you bitter, but to make you better and stronger. That's the question. It's not why, God, why? Why you allow this in my life? Why you don't take it away? Are you really there, God? You ever been there? Are you really there, God? Well, he is there. Is your faith in him there? And that's what we need to do. Go to Romans chapter 9 for a minute. Romans chapter 9, I, I, I gave this verse, I think it was last Sunday when I preached about hope in the potter's hand. Hope in the potter's hand. And right here in Romans chapter 9, I want you to notice in verse 19, Romans chapter 9, in verse 19, Paul says in Romans chapter 9, verse 19, Thou wilt say it unto me, why the he who find fault for who have resisted his will? I mean, we find fault with God. We blame God for being unloving, being uncared, for not being compassionate, for allowing the severe trial in my life, Lord, if you really care. Why you don't take away the severe trial, this, 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 this strong pain in my, in my heart? And you resist his will. We find fault with God. 
And then in verse 20, he says, Nabal, man, who art thou that replies against God? Who are you to argue with God? Who are you to talk back to God with complaints? Who are you? You're just a lump of clay. He's the master potter. He's the creator. You're the creature. Come on now. He's all-knowing. You don't know anything. I don't know anything. He's intelligent. I'm dumb. He's strong. I'm weak. He's wise. I'm not wise. He wins. I lose. Come on now. But we argue with God. Am I stepping on your toes this morning? Come on. That's, why you, that's your attitude towards God with the trials and testings. And then he goes on and says, Shall the thing form? Say to him that form, what thou hast made me thus? Most dangerous question to ask God. Why, God? Why you make me this way? Why you allow me in this situation, Lord? Why you allow this physical problem in my life? Why? Why you allow this in my marriage? Why you allow my kid to go wayward when I train him the best way I can to feel the Lord? And we just ask, why, why, why? Look, we need to just let God be God. He's the master potter. What we need to do is like that song we sang, have thy own way, Lord. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. What I am waiting, yield it and still. That will be our attitude. That's what the clay does. Just yield and be still. And let God shape you and mold you after his own image. That's what we need to do. The word patience in James chapter 5 in verse 11, it means cheerful endurance. That's what that word patient means. It means cheerful endurance. It is endurance without complaining. It is enduring without whining. That's the thought there. And, you know, the dictionary, the dictionary calls this word patient as this way. The dictionary calls it the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. It's cheerful endurance. That means you just, in, you, it's endurance without complaining and whining. So people are impatient and, and complain and get upset and quit when they go and get stuff. And God said that we should display patience. God said we should display patience with trial, cheerful endurance in the following area. I want to give you some areas that we could display Patience. You want patience? Cheerful endurance. Job did not complain. His wife did. He didn't charge God foolishly. In fact, he said, the Lord give, the Lord take away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. I came with nothing, I'm taking nothing with me. What a perspective. By the way, he was, he was no superhuman. He just trusted God. He just applied the char char character trait of patience, which I believe is a fruit of the Spirit. Temperance. Self-control. So we should display, God will bless you if you will cheerfully endure trials and tests in your He will bless you, like he did to Job. But we should display cheerful endurance in the following areas. Let me give you some following areas right here. Hebrews 12.1. The first area that we should display endurance is in the race that is set before us. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It goes there, especially the last statement of that verse. I'm just going to give you the last statement. And it says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know, the Christian life is not a picnic. It's not a cookout. When we go to the Supper of the Lamb, the marriage Supper of the Lamb in heaven, that's going to be a blast. That's going to be a feast and a cookout. But while we're here, the Christian life is not a playground. It's not a picnic. It's a race. It's a race. That's how the Bible describes the Christian life. It's a, a racetrack. And look, it says, let us run with patience, with cheerful endurance. Cheerful endurance means to go forward in the middle of pressure without giving up, like a runner who runs a race. He gets tough, but they keep on going. That's what that means. So 
you can tell the strength of a Christian by what it takes to stop him. And again, Hebrews 12, 1 says that we let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And the word patient means cheerful endurance. Everybody knows that a runner is going to win or lose primarily by his endurance. You cannot quit when it hurts. You cannot quit when your legs are on fire. You cannot quit when you feel like you, your feet are like lead. You cannot quit when your sights ache. You cannot quit. You'll never be a spiritual athlete if you are a quitter. No pain, no gain. Hey, his strength will empower you to run the race victoriously with cheerful endurance all the way to the end. All the way to the end. So, Satan wants Christians to quit. God wants us to cheerfully endure. Satan wants you to think God doesn't care, but God is really molding you and making you to be more like Christ to the trials. That's what God is doing. And then look at Hebrews chapter 11. Look what it says in verse 2 there. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author. You don't look to problems. You don't look to trials and temptations. And, the, and you look at the problem, they get bigger. You magnify them when you start getting worried. No, you look unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. And then he says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus, he kept going because he knew the outcome of it. He knew that God the Father had a purpose, a plan that would bring joy to the Father. When people, when he went to the cross, he saw the joy ahead. He said, there's suffering. I don't really want to go to the cross. He even told the Father, I think it was in Matthew 26. Uh, uh, he told him, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Lord, if it's possible to avoid the suffering, let's do it another way. God said, no, it's possible. You got to the cross. But he saw the joy. He saw the pain, but he saw the joy that would produce after, the, after he finished the race and he fulfilled his mission. Guess what he saw? People getting safe. Amen? No wonder Jesus said there's joy in heaven over one sinner than repent in Luke chapter 15, verse 7. So we often use Romans chapter 8, verse 28 when we face trials. And, we, and many times I claim it. Anybody got Romans 8, 28 memorized? Diane, I think that was Pastor Garrett's life verse, right? Was that Pastor Garrett's life verse? Right, Diane? Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Why? Right? We like to quote that a lot, and we should. Whatever you're experiencing, God is working it for your good. But we forget to read verse 29. Because verse 29 says that we were predestined to be, God is trying to uh, uh, mold us or make us conform us to the image of his son. So God would allow trials in your life to conform you to the image of Christ, to make you like Christ. Because the Bible, Peter talks about that Christ left us an example of suffering, that, that we should follow his steps. Galatians chapter 6, remember God's encouraging words in Galatians chapter 6 in verse 9. Listen to this, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And I believe Job put that to practice. Job definitely reaped God's blessing because he did not quit. He did not faint. In fact, the last chapter of Job chapter 42, verse 12, it says that the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning and you're going to miss out on the blessing when you just throw in the towel and give in to the pressure don't hey you, you got to tell God God it hurts it's painful but whatever you're doing don't stop come on now don't stop because he has a purpose he has a purpose and Job endured the race that was set before him before him let me just give you another area that we need to exercise patience, not only in the race that is set before us, but look, even in our waiting on God. We've got to learn how to wait on the Lord. The Bible tells us in Psalm 37, verse 7, it says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. That's what it says. Wait in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalm 37, verse 7. Look, the farmer illustrates the need of patience. He does not reap on the same day he plans. Rather, there's a long period of waiting. 
Learn that patience of the farmer. Sometimes this is the hardest thing for us to do. Waiting is the thing that we do least well. But true faith waits. True patience, true endurance waits on God. It has confidence that God is able to do what he has promised. Amen? Romans chapter 4 verse 21, it says, And being fully persuaded that what he has promised, he is able to perform. What God has promised, he's able to perform. Take God at his word. Stop going by feelings. Stop going by emotion and stop letting pressure discourage you and trust the Lord doing pressure. That's what we need to do because faith looks beyond all difficulties to God and his precious promises. That's what faith does. And that's what God's trying to do to the trials of life. God is trying to build our faith, Christian. Here's another area that we could exercise this patience. Not only the race that is set before us, not only we got to learn how to wait on God. Be on God's timetable, not your own timetable. Stop forcing an answer from God. i say that again. Stop forcing an answer from God. His timing is better than your time. Be on the Lord's schedule. He always shows up on time. So here's another area that we should... Uh, Exercise faith in Christ's return. Christ's return. Second Thessalonians, let me read it to you. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. In Second Thessalonians chapter 3, look what it says. We got to wait patiently for the return of Christ because Christ could come anytime. His coming is imminent. No man knows, not even Jesus knows, but the Father. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, it says in verse 5 here, And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Look, Christ is coming back for us. He's coming back. I think as Christians we put up with a lot of stress and a lot of obstacles and a lot of trials. Anybody who's been experiencing tough times and obstacles and difficult times and discouragements and, and valleys. We all, we all going to face that for the rest of our Christian life. But guess what? Bless God. One day, in a glorious day, uh, 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 the, the, the blessed hope, the Bible called Christ, is coming back and take us out of this mess of world. That's going to be exciting. Amen? That's going to be exciting when, that's it, no more battles, no more struggling for the Christian, if you're safe. So look, that will strengthen your heart. That will put a smile on your face. That will cause you to respond properly to the trials. Because it's going to end one day. This is temporal. So we ought to show patience not only in the race that he set before us, not only in learn how to wait on God and his timing, but also in Christ's return. But also we ought to exercise patience in tribulation. Romans chapter 12, verse 12, it says patient in tribulation. We are to endure tribulation with patience, with cheerful endurance. With cheer, because cheerful endurance in tribulation can turn the misery, the discouragement into blessings. So we are to exercise patience in tribulation. And then, let me give you another one how we are to exercise patience. Here's another one, suffering wrongly. Suffering wrongly. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4 for a minute. 1 Peter chapter 2. Let me show you 1 Peter chapter 2. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Suffering wrongly. Look at verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. He says, For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering, how? Wrongfully. For what glory, for what glory is it if when you are buffeted for your fault, you should take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is what? Acceptable with God. If you're suffering for wrongdoing, you deserve it. You brought it upon yourself because you reap what you sow. The Bible says that uh, be not deceived, God is not mine. For what so, so men should also reap, he should sow. You, you reap what you sow. This is talking about suffering wrongfully. 
If you're suffering today, it's because of sin, because of your rebellion. Then you brought it upon yourself. You reap what you sow. Just ask God to forgive you, amen, and get right with the Lord. But if it is for just for being a Christian, for doing right, praise God. Because that's acceptable to God. Amen? If anybody is, is false accusing you and they're mistreating you and you're going through suffering wrongfully, you, you, hey, you're blessed. You're in the center of God's will. God has your back. God is cheering you up. God is in your side. Don't quit. Keep on moving. Keep trusting God because God blesses those who patiently deal with wrong. When you are uh, uh, suffering wrongfully, God will bless you for that, my friend. And look, another way that you could exercise patience is doing good always. In Romans chapter 2, in verse 7, there's a statement then in Romans chapter 2, verse 7. It says, to them who by patience continue in well-doing. So look, no matter what happened, no matter how people treat you, don't, don't ever start doing right. Always do what's right. You know how the Bible says, love your enemies. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, right? Don't render evil with good, but overcome evil with good. You don't, you don't, you don't respond with anger, with vengeance. No, God will take care of that. He will do a better job than you. God will make all wrong right one day. Leave it in God's hand. Because you go ahead and you take matters in your own hand, you're going to mess it up. You're going to make matters worse. Amen? So exercise patience. This cheerful endurance, this area. The race that is set before us. Waiting on God, his timetable, and Christ's return. He's going to get us out of here one day. It's going to be over. Uh, tribulation, when you face trials. Doing good, suffering wrongly. God will bless you if you cheerfully endure. He will bless you. Let me finish with this. Let me finish with this. I'm telling you, blessings that God gives to those who cheerfully endure. You will be, let me give you, let me give you two final blessings here, three, uh, three blessings here that God will give to those who cheerfully endure. The blessing is you will be perfect, you will be mature. James chapter 1 verse 4, it says, But let patient have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So you want to, look, what, what, what's, when you respond properly to the trials with patience and cheerful endurance, guess what's going to make you? It's not going to make you weaker. It's going to make you stronger and more mature. That's the blessing, amen? And then you will be pleasing to God. I just read to you 1 Peter 1.20. When you suffer wrongly and respond properly, you will be, that's pleasing to God. And not only that, last, you will receive a crown one day. You will receive a crown one day. God's going to reward our service one day. The Bible talks about five crowns that God's going to give one day to Christians. This is one of them. This is one of them. You will receive a crown. God is watching your attitude during trials. He's keeping records. James chapter 1 talks about that you receive a crown. James chapter 1 verse 12. It says, blessed or happy is the man that endures temptation. That means trials, testings. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. You will be mature. You will be pleasing to God. You will receive a crown. You will receive a crown. And by the way, this is the characteristic trait that we should pass to our children. Because they're watching you how you respond to trials. And if you get bent out of shape, guess what? It's contagious. This is one character trait that we got to pass to our children. They're watching. Those little eyes are watching every move you make. Man, what a wonderful character trait to pass to our children. But we got to live it before them. Let's stand on our feet, every eye closed, every head bow. I wonder how you're doing. Patience is something that we all need to improve. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Who, while our heads are bowed, nobody looking. Who could honestly say, Pastor, my patience, God knows my heart. My patience is not where it's supposed to be. My patience needs to improve, Pastor. Let me see your hand. My patience needs to improve. Well, you heard what it takes. You heard in the message how to obtain it. And the invitation is open for you, those who are 
who need to respond to the message and you want to spend time with the Lord in prayer, that's why we give an invitation so you could just spend time with the Lord. So those of you who are in need to respond to the message and to respond to the invitation and talk to the Lord in prayer, the invitation is open for you. Anybody here this morning, you're not even safe? You're not 100% sure, but you're going to say that if you die, you go to heaven? You better get Jesus first in your life because you'll never make it. You lose your mind. If you're struggling with patience, if you're, if you're, if you blow, blow one of the guys that, that, that uh, have little patience, and your patience wear out easy, you better get Jesus. You better get Jesus first in your life, and he will help you. He will strengthen you, and he will help you with endurance. Father, I pray you use the invitation, Lord.